well. The t-shirts that you've seen around the fundraiser for our summer musical activities for kids program may be enough if you were not to look outside to lead you to believe that the summer is upon us. Two straight weekends of rain have done a pretty good job of dispelling that idea, but those 85 degree days in the afternoon can get you a little confused. But summer's not here quite yet. The traditional marker of the arrival of summer, of course, is Memorial Day weekend, the first of these summer national holidays that we celebrate together. Memorial Day, when we honor those who have given their lives in service of our nation. And then, of course, we have the 4th of July, just a few weeks later, as we celebrate the birth of our nation, the independence that we know together. And these national holidays have me thinking a little bit about an idea that you may never have really realized, but it's true, which is that every nation has a story that it tells about itself. Every people has a story that they tell about themselves. So for our nation, for the United States of America, the story that we tell, the story that we celebrate, especially on the 4th of July, but that we proclaim really throughout the year, is a story of freedom. Ours is a nation built upon an idea, the idea that we are to be ruled, to be governed, not by a certain class of people, but by ourselves. That we have the right to govern ourselves, to elect officials who will govern us. That we are a free people. The story of America, the story we tell about ourselves, is one of liberty, is one of freedom. So let's think about a different nation. It's not just us that does this. The story of our, uh, our cousins across the pond, Great Britain. What's the story that they tell about themselves? I was trying to pin it down to one word the way I could with freedom for America. And the best I was able to come up with, the story that they tell about themselves, is a story of maturity. Theirs is a much older nation than ours, you understand. And they often understand themselves as the guardians of Western civilization. They were the ones who during World War II kept that stiff upper lip. And even to this day, that is the mentality that they carry forward. That upstart nations like the U.S. across the ocean, they can get pretty hot-headed. They can get pretty crazy from time to time. But we, we as Brits, we are more dignified. We carry ourselves with a certain degree of class that those Americans don't always. Theirs is a story of maturity. And for the people of God, for the people of God, I would tell you this morning that if you wanted to pin one word to the story that God's people have told about themselves since the days of Moses, it's a story of liberation. A story of God rescuing his people from bondage and bringing them into freedom. The story that God's people tell about themselves is a story of liberation. Now, it's easy to see this in the Old Testament. All you got to do is read the book of Exodus, and you get a pretty good idea of where God's people got this idea about themselves. That's where you get perhaps the most famous story in all of the Old Testament. The story of God's people in bondage and slavery in Egypt, crying out to him for deliverance, and God sending them a deliverer. Sending Moses, and through great signs and wonders, bringing them out of that captivity. Bringing them out of slavery. Crossing the Red Sea miraculously, bringing them through years in the wilderness and ultimately delivering them to the land God had promised them. Theirs was a story of rescue from slavery and deliverance to a promised land. This is the story God's people told about themselves. 
generation after generation after generation. But what you may not have thought about quite as quickly is that this is a story which is picked up in the New Testament as well. When the definition of what it means to be part of God's people is expanded by the cross of Christ, that story nevertheless remains ours. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 6, 6 through 7. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed, so that we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. In Galatians 5, 1, Paul puts it this way, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And in our passage this morning, from Colossians 1, 11 through 14, the 13th verse says that he has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. Out of slavery and into kingdom life. Out of bondage and into the land God has promised to us. This morning we're in the fifth part of our six-part post-Easter series on the implications of Jesus's resurrection, on what it means to have new life in Christ. And so this morning, what I want to talk about is this broader narrative, the story we tell about ourselves, of what it means to be part of the people of God of what kind of freedom it is that the resurrection of Jesus brings to us. So if you've got your Bible this morning or you want to grab one of the ones in front of you, we're in the book of Colossians today, Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. Colossians chapter 1, verses 11 through 14. And we'll get to verses 11 and 12, strangely enough, at the end. I'm going to start in verse 13, if that's all right with you. Where Paul says, I'll read it once again, that he has rescued us from the power of darkness. Rescued us from the power of darkness. Now, that, that language of light and darkness, that's something you see a lot in the New Testament, but not as much in Paul's writings as in John's writings. That's a theme that John picks up pretty repeatedly, both in the gospel that he wrote as well as in his three epistles. So, for example, in Luke 1, oh, well, what do you know? Uh, every now and then you notice something in your notes for the first time when you're at the pulpit. That's Luke. That's not John. But nevertheless, whew, Luke 1, 79. Uh, you know what confused me? This is John the Baptist's father, Zechariah. Uh, saying that Jesus is the one who will give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Then we go to the Gospel of John. We were going to get there eventually. In John 3, 19, that same chapter that our kids will be learning about this summer in Smack, John 3, 19 says that the light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. In 1 John 1, 5 through 7, he writes that this is the message we've heard from him and that we proclaim to you, that God is light and that in him is no darkness at all. So if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, well, then we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Paul's borrowing that language of light and darkness here in Colossians for the same reason that John used it. Darkness is this all-encompassing term for sin and for guilt and for condemnation and for death. Darkness is representative of our predicament apart from God when we are separated from him. This, this is the slavery you're born into. This is the wilderness that you are wandering before you come to know Christ. But, Paul says, 
Jesus has rescued you from this darkness. He's brought you out of this darkness. He's delivered you. Into what? That's where verse 14 fills us in. Into redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Because by the blood of Jesus... By his sacrificial death upon the cross, we are made clean. By the blood of Jesus, our debts are paid. And so this then is is the first and really the most important way that Jesus brings us freedom. By bringing us out of condemnation and into forgiveness. Out of condemnation and into forgiveness. A few years back, there was a movie that came out called Just Mercy. It told the story of a man named Walter Johnny D. McMillan. 1988, Johnny D. McMillan was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Rhonda Morrison. Only for... Johnny D. to spend years appealing that particular sentence. McMillan spent six years on Alabama's death row, insisting upon his innocence. Appeal after appeal after appeal. Four times he was turned down when appealing. He spent six years condemned on death row, preparing to be executed in Alabama. Until in 1993, the Court of Criminal Appeals reversed that lower court decision. Based upon DNA evidence, they revealed that he had been wrongfully convicted and he was fully exonerated, made a free man. For six years, he stood condemned and in a moment... He found himself set free. I bring him up because, like Johnny D., we we stand condemned. And like Johnny D., we are now made clean. But here's the big difference between him and us. We are guilty of our crimes. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23 tells us. When we stand before Almighty God, we cannot claim to be sinless. We cannot claim to be guiltless. We cannot claim to be clean before Him. But on the cross, Jesus gave us grace that we did not deserve. Gave us mercy that we had not earned. Because of what Jesus did on the cross... We are brought out of that condemnation and brought into forgiveness and redemption. We are rescued from sin and death and brought into new life in Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ lifts us out of condemnation and delivers us to forgiveness and redemption. Now look with me at Verse 12 says, giving thanks to the Father who's enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. Now that that word inheritance in the context of scripture, it immediately brings to mind for me and maybe it does for you as well. That famous story that Jesus told of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. You know the story, I suspect, of the son who goes to his father demanding his share of his father's inheritance. Saying, I want what's coming to me after you die, but I want it now. I don't want to wait until you're gone. This sign of disrespect toward his father. His father nevertheless gives him what he's asking for. And the man goes off and spends it on God knows what. Goes off to a foreign country, goes off to a faraway land. And before long, all the money he's been given is gone. And he finds himself at rock bottom. 
tending to pigs and wishing he could eat the food that they're eating. It's only then that it dawns on him that perhaps he could return home to his father. Go back to the place that he had once known as a refuge, as, as home. And maybe hire himself out as a servant to his father, where at least he'd have a roof over his head and three square meals. So he goes back prepared to beg his father for some semblance of mercy. Just let me be a servant. Just let me be a slave. But when he returns home, his father runs to him with open arms, welcoming him not as a servant, but as a son. Killing the fatted calf and throwing a party to celebrate because his son who once was lost now is found. What we have from the middle of that story to the end of that story is the tale of somebody who goes from scraps to the banquet table, from servitude to prosperity. And what Paul indicates in our passage today is that when you receive new life in Christ, you receive that same kind of spiritual transformation. Because God enables you to share in the inheritance of the saints. The way he puts it in Galatians 4, 7 is that you are no longer a slave, but a child. No longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. In Christ, we are brought out of servitude and into spiritual prosperity. Now, if there's one thing that we love in this country, it is a good rags to riches story. We love a story of somebody who starts down here and makes it up to here. Whether it's in fiction, in the novels of Horatio Alger, to the Rocky movies. Whether it's in real life. We like celebrities who start with nothing and end up with everything. Whether we're talking about Elvis or Oprah. Even just, just game shows. The fun of a game show is seeing somebody who is perfectly normal, just like you and me, who by the end of the episode is suddenly given everything. Gets to go home with a brand new car and tens of thousands of dollars just because they guessed the right letters on the big board. We like a rags to riches story, but we want to see people earn it. We want to make sure that they came by it through their hard work, through their sweat and their blood. LeBron James is worth $1.2 billion today because he's really good at basketball. J.K. Rowling is worth a billion dollars today because she wrote some books that people really, really liked. We like those stories because those people earned their way to greatness, earned their way to to prosperity. Well, the story of God's people is a spiritual rags to riches story. It's a story of God lifting us out of the depths of poverty and bringing us into a glorious inheritance. But we didn't earn this adoption as sons and daughters of Almighty God. We didn't earn this adoption as heirs to his kingdom. It is a gift. It is an act of grace from Almighty God toward us. Because your natural lot in life is servitude, is slavery to sin. We are entitled to a sort of spiritual poverty. But God in Christ brings you out of that bondage to sin and brings you into the glorious inheritance of the saints. And that brings me to that last element of this new life this morning. The inheritance you receive is not yours alone. It's the inheritance, Paul says, of the saints. You're transferred into 
the kingdom of his beloved son. When we talk about salvation, we often talk in the singular tense, when scripture is almost always speaking in the plural. We talk about what Jesus does for me when the Bible more often talks about what Jesus does for us. We talk about it what, what it means to be a disciple in the New Testament when the New Testament is a lot more concerned with what it means to be a church. See, God's word is clear that this new life we are given is not something we undertake as a solo endeavor. It's apart from God that you are alone. Think of the parable of the lost sheep in Luke 15. The one who goes off by himself and is sought then by the shepherd. It's apart from the shepherd that you're alone. When you're given new life in Christ, you move from being alone to now being a part of a family. To being a part of a kingdom. To having brothers and sisters in Christ. I have a very dear friend, a fellow minister, who as part of her personal gospel ministry, fosters, fosters kids. And so I've gotten to learn a little bit about that system, about that process through her experience and what she's shared with me. And so I've learned that what happens is that with virtually no notice, just a phone call a few hours before, kids are dropped on her doorstep from families that have a great deal of baggage. Families that are working through some very difficult things. Parents who aren't able to care for their kids at that time. And so, just a few hours after that phone call, these kids show up on her doorstep. And in an instant, they are now part of her family. With no warning, with no preparation, they go from being strangers to being family. I gotta tell you, church family, that's, that's one of the purest expressions of gospel love imaginable. To take someone who has known the kind of soul-wrenching separation and loneliness that most of us can't fathom, and then to instantaneously say, you have family now. That's what God does for us. That's what God does for each and every person who professes faith in Jesus as Lord. They become his people. They become his children. They go from being alone to being family. They go from being separated to suddenly having a wealth of brothers and sisters. Jesus delivers us from the loneliness of separation to the joy of kingdom family. God calls us in Christ out of an old life and into a new one. Out of an old way of being, into a new way of being. Out of a life of darkness and servitude and separation, and into a life of redemption and inheritance and family. And the day will come when faith will become sight, and all of the darkness, all of the bondage, all of the bad will be gone. But until he returns, we still have to reckon with the lingering traces of the old life. There's still sin in the world. There's still death in the world. We still have to reckon with that. We still have to deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis. We're citizens of the kingdom, but we're still residents of this world. 
So what do we do until faith becomes sight? What do we do until that glorious day? He tells us, may you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father. My prayer for you, as you reckon with those traces of the old life, as you navigate what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom, even as you're a resident of this world, as you do your best to live the Jesus way in a world that does not know that way, my prayer for you is that God would give you strength, that God would give you a spirit of endurance, that God would help you to persevere in the hardest of times. He's given us everything we could ask for, freedom in his name. He'll give us the strength to navigate in the meantime.